Good morning, Redeemer. Uh, Merry Christmas to you and to your family. Um, It goes without saying that this year was an interesting year and also a difficult year, a challenging year for many of us. And yet, uh, here we are today on Christmas Sunday, um, able to worship together. And I hope and pray that despite whatever challenges that you may be going through, uh, may the Lord, may our God remind us of how much he loves and cares for us. As we celebrate today the birth of our Savior, uh, who humbled himself so that he may not only share in our misery, but ultimately deliver us uh, from them. So uh, with that thought, can we all rise at this time and uh, hear God's call to worship, which comes from this wonderful prophecy uh, from Isaiah, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. Uh, May these words uh, give you strength and comfort you. Hear now the call to worship. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Amen. Can we meditate upon those words and prepare our hearts as we come before God to worship Him? Let's pray together. Redeemer and Lord, more than ever, the world needs to hear that you are wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So remind us during this Christmas season in the midst of a pandemic that you became one of us, not only to share in our pain and sorrows, but ultimately to deliver us from suffering and death to bring peace, to bring healing, reconciliation, and new life. So as we worship and celebrate the birth of our humble Savior, Lord, would you strengthen our faith and grant all of us hope. In his precious name we pray. Amen. All right, good morning, Redeemer. As we celebrate the coming of our King, would you join in as we exalt him, worship him, and adore him. Let's sing now.
In word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. Oh, come let us adore Him. Oh, come let us adore Him. Oh, come let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. For He alone is worthy, for He alone is worthy, for He alone is worthy, Christ the Lord. Amen. That's Father, that's why we're here, that's why we're gathered. Because You alone are worthy, God. And we're celebrating, Lord, that you're coming, you making a way for us, God, and we're thankful, God. What a year it's been, but God, it's important to remember during these times, Lord, remind us the truth of the ultimate sacrifice that was done on our behalf through you, that secured our hope, our life in you, God. Would that bring us to our feet in worship? As we sing, God, remind our souls, awaken faith, give us hope. Sing light of the world. So light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. The beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. You're all together worthy. You're all together wonderful to me. So King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, and all for love's sake became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, you're all together worthy. You're all together wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sins upon that cross. I'll never know how much it costs to see sins upon that cross. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, you're all together worthy. You're all together wonderful to me. Amen. Please be seated at this time. Would you turn with me to your program? And also, uh, it will be on uh, the uh, screen as well. We'll be going over... Uh, the 35th uh, question of the Heidelberg Catechism as we talk about uh, the Holy uh, Conception. And uh, um, may uh, the, these words and also um, 
the answer that we will recite uh, bring you uh, great joy and also continue to strengthen your faith and understanding of our uh, wonderful Savior. So with that, I'll read the question. Please respond by reading the answer in unison. Question 35 asks, what does it mean that he, wa he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary? That the eternal Son of God, who is and remains true and eternal God, took to himself through the working of the Holy Spirit from the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, a truly human nature, so that he might become David's true descendant, like his brothers in every way except for sin. Amen. Uh, the incarnation, uh, the birth of our Savior, that God becoming man had a very specific uh, purpose, wasn't there? The Son of God became man in flesh and blood, came, became just like us, so that he may become that perfect sacrifice that all sinners need, that you and I truly need. He didn't just come to set a good example for us, but he came to save us from sin and death, to give us new life and righteousness. Um, it's all other religions really talk about how we could reach God, right? But Christianity, our faith, talks about how God reached down to us. He became one of us, seeking after sinners, undeserving sinners just like us. So as we uh, continue in our uh, worship on this Christmas Sunday, may our hearts be filled with joy and gladness uh, for the birth of our Savior. So with that, uh, we'll be singing the first Noel uh, led by our brother Andy. join with us. The first Noel the angels did say was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep Noel, 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 Noel Born is the King of Israel Then they looked up and saw a star Shining in the east beyond them far and to the earth he gave a great light and so we continued both day and night noel 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 born is the king of israel noel 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 Born is the King of Israel. Amen. As we now um, come before our God on this Christmas Sunday uh, to repent of our sins, let me read for us this familiar passage from Philippians 2, verses 4 through 11. And as we hear uh, the word of God, may the Spirit convict us, and also bless us. So here's Philippians 2, verses 4 through 11. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's go to the Lord now in repentance. Let's pray together.
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. My brothers and sisters, what a glorious promise that is. So let us continue to cling on to that wonderful promise by faith and rejoice in, in God's great love for us in his son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Can we all rise at this time and respond to God's love and his blessings in our lives with our uh, offerings as we sing the doxology together? Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram. God of peace, we come with joy and adoration this Lord's day as we worship you together with our families and brothers and sisters in Christ, our Redeemer. We especially rejoice today as we celebrate the birth of our Savior, your Son, the God-Man, Jesus the Christ. It has been a rough year for all of us. We have been uprooted out of our comfort zones, and what we held on to for stability and peace has been stripped away. Many of us have had to deal with changes in our livelihoods, our children have had to get adjusted to distance learning, and there is a prevailing anxiety and worry in us. Moreover, many of our members have had to deal with their own illnesses and injuries and the health problems of their family members. All of this with ongoing struggles against racism and disunity in our nation. However, as you remind us with the birth of our Savior Jesus, you have plans that far exceed our expectations. You are wise and you are holy. Only you would have used the unusual circumstances of Tamar, Rahab, and Bathsheba to eventually lead to the birth of the world's Savior, a perfect child born only after multiple improbable and sometimes sinful events. You care for the broken and the discarded. You even use them for your glory and elevate them to places of esteem. So, while we may never understand why 2020 has been such a roller coaster, we pray for faith to understand that this is all in your divine plan and that you will be glorified through it all. We pray for healing for our injured members, heal them and speed their recovery after surgery. We pray for healthy pregnancies and deliveries for our pregnant mothers, Hannah and Esther. We pray for the parents of our members who are dealing with cancer, that you will bring healing, comfort and peace to their families. We pray for our missionaries, Tim Lim and the Cha family. May you continue to use them mightily to bring the Cambodian and Japanese people to a saving faith in Christ. Give wisdom to the Cha's as they decide where and in what capacity to serve you in a church plant or a small local church, and bless Pastor Damon's preparation to teach his class on discovering Jesus in the Old Testament. As this year comes to a close, we also reflect on the many years of faithful service that our brother Pastor Daniel has given to Redeemer. We are so thankful for Pastor Daniel, Grace, William, and Karis. We thank God for their humble service, hospitality, and friendship. Pastor Daniel and his family have meant so much to us all, and we have been blessed by his words of wisdom, challenge, and humor over the years. Thank you for leading him to a new calling at Karis Mission Church. We pray that you will use him to shepherd this new flock and stir a radical faith in Karis' congregation. We pray that the transition will be smooth and that Grace and the kids will find a loving family with Karis Mission Church as well. We also pray that this new chapter in their lives will enable new collaborations for Redeemer and Karis in the future. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is the name of the Lord. In the name of Emmanuel we pray, amen. Prayer, uh, Elder Eugene, we have Good morning. Uh, Please join a with couple me in of prayer. special treats today actually. Um, Matthew chapter 1. The reading by Ava and Sophie Ree. Uh, they'll be reading from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through uh, 12. Uh, the text right before the sermon text that Pastor James will be reading. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. So enjoy.
Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. During the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who had been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people, chiefs, priests, and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet had written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw that the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Good morning. Uh, it is so glad. Thank you so much, Cameron, and for Ava and Sophie for uh, doing this for us today. We wanted to give you some resemblance, perhaps, of what our Christmas Sunday is like. It's always wonderful to have our children participate. We just even sharing how we missed the kids program this year because of the fact of, of this pandemic. Um, but we're glad that you're able to join us online and on live stream today as we come and we worship our God and King indeed. And today I want to wish all of you especially a very wonderful and Merry Christmas. I know that Christmas uh, will not be the same for us, for many of us this year because of the pandemic. And for us, perhaps for many of you already it feels a little bit different. We're not at church coming together for our Chris annual Christmas Sunday service. And for many of us, there will be less parties, less festivities this year. Or perhaps for some of you, there will be none. Traditions you held dear that you have done every year will be broken. And for many of us, you will not be able to gather with our family members. Why? Because of this pandemic. Or perhaps some of your family members are in the hospital or considered high risk. For others, this will may be the loneliest Christmas that they will ever experience because we cannot get together. For some families, they will not be able to give as many gifts. Why? Because of the fact that this year has been a financial burden upon many families. And as a result, there are many kids who will receive far less gifts or no gifts at all. And that's why I'm not sure about you, but for many people, they don't perhaps want to even celebrate Christmas this year. Why? Because it just does not feel the same. But dear friends, this is why we need to celebrate Christmas. This is why we are here. Because it's on this day that we are reminded that even in times of hopelessness, in times of darkness, that there is hope, that there is joy. Why? Because our Savior has been born. And that's the thing, is that even though Christmas name may not feel the same, the message of Christmas will always remain, remain the same, and that never changes. As a matter of fact, the significance and the importance of this day shines even brighter and greater in darkness. That even perhaps this year that this idea of Christmas, the idea of Christmas, which become even that much more important because of this pandemic. Just recently we have heard from many of us that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Why? Because of the vaccine. But dear friends, the true light is that the Savior is born. That is our ultimate hope. Not a vaccine, not a cure. But knowing that our sins have been forgiven, that we have been redeemed because of the birth of our Savior, because of what happened there in Bethlehem on Christmas Day. And that's why my hope this morning is that rather than allowing this pandemic to ruin your Christmas, is to use this pandemic to help us understand the, magis the majesty and the glory of what Christmas is all about. For just as we find ourselves celebrating Christmas in the midst of a pandemic, remember what the very first Christmas was all about. Because you see, the first Christmas was also surrounded by a far greater tragedy, 
more than a pandemic, that there was a massacre of innocent young boys. And because of this, perhaps, perhaps of this pandemic, we have a greater appreciation of what occurred on that first day. Every, Chris, every Christmas, we celebrate the joys and the comforts of Christmas. We love our Christmas songs, the story of the shepherd and the angels, the story of Mary and Joseph and having the baby born in a manger. We love the story of the wise men who see the star and come from afar away and bring gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But we forget that the, the story of Christmas ends with a tragedy, that it ends with brutality and a massacre. So often we have sanitized Christmas so that for a day we can escape the harshness and the brutality of this world, the world that we live in. But you see, it's when we understand that world, it's understand what has actually occurred at the beginning when Christ was born, that you and I would understand why Christ needed to come and why he is the hope of the world. And that's why this morning I ask you to open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 13 to 23. Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 23. For this is what occurred on that day. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. It remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in, uh, in all that region who were two years old or younger, or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when they heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned in the dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Lazarus, so that was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he shall be called a Nazarene. You see, this morning we see the brutality that occurred in Bethlehem. Because we see Merit Matthew's narrative around the birth of Christ ends with this massacre. Of every male child under the age of two in the city of Bethlehem, the city where Jesus, by the hands of a deranged and paranoid king, would try to kill him. And we forget this story. We forget what occurred there in Bethlehem. All we remember is the story of a child being born in the manger, but we forget what this child and who he is and how the world responded to the birth of this child. Yes, there were magi. Yes, there were shepherds. There, was, there were angels. But there was also a paranoid king who wanted to kill Jesus. You see, the wise men from the east followed the star and they came to Jerusalem. And they came to King Herod and they asked him, Where is he that is born the king of the Jews? And hearing that another king may have been born, Herod would not have any of it. And asked if they find him in Bethlehem to tell him so that he too may go and worship him. But we know that it was all a lie. He wanted to know so that he could kill him. Because you see, just like the kings of that day, what do you do when there's a rival king? You get rid of that rival king. And when the wise men found him, they worshipped him and gave him gifts. And an angel appeared to them at that night and warned them not to go back to Herod. And it's the same angel that would also appear to Joseph. And we'll come to Joseph and tell him, take the baby Jesus and Mary and flee to Egypt because Herod was seeking to kill Jesus. And just like Moses, for remember prior to this massacre, there was another massacre of young Hebrew boys that occurred in Exodus when Moses was born. Remember the story where the Pharaoh ordered all child, all male children, at birth, would be thrown into Nile River and to be killed. 
But what happened to Moses? Moses was spared. And Moses would live, even though all these other children would die. And so too, Jesus would also live in the midst of this massacre as well. And seeing that the wise men were not going to come back, he orders that all the little boys to be killed. And you can only imagine what occurred there in Bethlehem. But why did he do this? Herod is paranoid, Herod is paranoid even though he is a king. Because he's afraid that he may lose his kingdom. And so what does he do? He acts unjustly and kills to secure his kingdom. But yet at least Herod recognized who this child was. At least Herod believed what the wise men said, that he is a king. This is why he acts this way. Because he needed to get rid of his rival. He wanted to hold on to that which he had. And thinking about the nature and what Herod did, we realize that he is no different than any other political leader in our day as well. For we have seen leaders, we have seen kingdoms who have also killed innocent people and lives and shattered homes. Why? So that they can retain their power. We've seen the Holocaust. We've seen the genocide. Even now around the world where a minority group of people are being attacked and jailed such as the people, the Rohingya people in Myanmar, or the Uyghur people in China. The, these days are occurring even to this day. We've seen the genocide in Africa. And all these people, and all these countries, they always say they do it in the name of peace. But so often, they don't do it for the peaceful reason, it's so that they can retain their power. And like Herod, rather than using their power to protect people and to serve people, they used their power to serve and protect themselves. And in order for them to get what they want, they resort to violence and murder. And what we see occurring with Herod and Herod in Bethlehem is no different, perhaps, what we see around the world today. We see these atrocities. We see the evil. We see the pain and we see the suffering. And we wonder whether or not it will be made right. We wonder where that justice is. Because you see, it is callous. And it is absolutely immoral. And yet this is the world that we live in, where these leaders are still in power and in control. But you see, it is that world that our Savior was born into. It is that world that this King of all kings and the Lord of all lords has come. And it's a world that would reject him and a world that desired to get rid of him because of who he is. But it's not only a world where we see these immoral and unethical leaders who are carrying out their own whims for their own power and glory. But you can only imagine the pain and the anguish and suffering that they had, that these mothers had to endure as they would lose their sons, as their sons would be taken away from their homes as they would be stripped from their arms and killed right before their own eyes. You can only imagine the weeping and the wailing from these women. You can only imagine when the women would try to comfort the other women who lost their sons, who were brutally murdered there in Bethlehem. As a matter of fact, Matthew recalls this and thinks about this and remembers what Jeremiah 31.15 says, which is quoted here in Matthew chapter 2 where Jeremiah laments the deportation of Israel. For Israel is about to go to exile to Babylon. And this is why he writes these words. Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. In other words, Matthew seeing this, Remiss the lamentation that Jeremiah would lament when Israel would have to go into exile. And to express God's lament over losing his children as they were about to go to exile, he uses Rachel weeping for her children. For remember that Rachel, who is Rachel? It was Jacob's wife. And remember what happens to Rachel. She would eventually die. 
you, might, you may not know this, but Rachel would die giving birth to her son. And he would, she would name him Ben-Oni, son of my trouble. And when did this occur? On her way to Bethlehem as well. You see, that's how Rachel dies. As she gives birth to her son on the way to Bethlehem. And yet she would not be comforted. And so in order for us to understand how God laments to see his son being handed over to Babylon, he uses Rachel's mourning, Rachel's refusal to be comforted, to express what he is going through. And this is why Christian author Wendy Zoba writes this. A mother weeping for her lost children is as bad as it gets in this life. It is God's metaphor for the apogee of anguish. In other words, what Wendy Zoba is saying is this, that there is nothing worse than a mother losing a child. There is a saying when a husband or wife loses their spouse, there is a thing you call the remaining survivor. You call them a widow or a widower. When a child loses their parents, you call them an orphan. But when a parent loses a child, what do you call that parent? What do you call the surviving parent? There is no word. There is no term for it. Perhaps because of the fact that there is no word that can ever make up for that sense of loss. To lose a child, for a mom to lose a son, or to a mom to lose a child, there is nothing worse than that. And you can only imagine a city full of women who have lost their children. Could you imagine the weeping, the wailing, and the lamentation? And this pain is all too real for me. I remember the time a friend of mine, a dear friend, a mentor, who lost their 11-year-old daughter in the middle of the night. And to see his anguish, and pain was absolutely devastating and overwhelming. I remember going to that funeral, just seeing the hurt, to see the emptiness. It was absolutely brutal. But not only my friend, but even as a church, we have seen the brutality of this. We have seen those at our own church who have experienced this devastating loss as well as we had to weep and mourn with our friends who have lost their sons in infancy. A friend who, a member of our church who lost her child at eight months old. And in all my years of ministry, there has been nothing more difficult, more wrenching, more overwhelming than to enter their darkness and their grief with them. There is never a moment where I have felt so helpless that no matter what I said, will not bring any comfort. Like she said, like Matthew said, like Jeremiah says, that Rachel will not be comforted. What do you say to a parent who has lost their son or daughter? There are no words, perhaps, that will be able to give them comfort. And yet you can only imagine a city, a city full of women weeping and willing for their sons. Where is that peace on earth that the angels have promised and they've sung about? For these women, the birth of Christ did not bring peace, but only pain and agony. And maybe if you, if you were to ask them saying, hey, the king of all kings, and the Lord of all lords will be born, but your son may die. I wonder whether or not they would say it was worth it. Because that is the harshness of the reality of what it means to lose a child. And yet to make matters worse, the angel appears to, to told the angel appears to the Magi to not return to Herod, and also comes to Joseph and tells him to take Mary and Joseph and flee to Egypt because Herod is looking to kill Jesus. How easily it would have been, it been, been for the moms to ask, why couldn't he come to all the moms to warn them? Why only go to Mary, but why not visit my house? Why not tell me that this is about to occur? Oh, how about this? After Jesus flees and makes it, then why don't you come and save us? 
Why does the angel only appear to Mary, but not to Joseph, but not to us as well? Why does God not intervene? Why does my son have to die? In the moments of grief, we cry out for answers. We cannot understand how these tragedies occur or how God can allow these things to happen in our lives. And so often the answers don't come. And we're only left dealing with the pain. Haven't you ever thought about that? Why did he only appear to Mary and Joseph but not all the other kids? All the other parents? And how hard it would have been. And this is part of the Christmas story that perhaps we don't want to hear. This is part of the Christmas story that we don't want to deal with. We want to hear about the shepherds. We want to hear about baby Jesus in the manger. We want to hear about the angels who sing glory to the Lord and the highest. But even though this is a story that we don't want to hear, it's a story that we need to hear. For it opens our eyes to the reality of the world that our Savior was born in. It tells us that this world is broken and fallen. It opens our eyes from the illusion that this world is getting better. That the world is good. People have often said that the world is getting better and better. Why? We have more cures than ever before. We have more knowledge than before. We have made tremendous scientific and medical advances. We are living longer than we ever did before in our lives. And that is true. Technology has increased. Medicine has advanced. But we still have massacres around the world. We still have children who are being exploited as sex slaves or as soldiers in unjustified wars. We still see these rulers acting in unjust and ungodly ways who are inflicting harm on so many people. And somehow we think that morally that we have advanced, but have we really? No, we live in a broken and fallen world. And this pandemic has reminded us of that reality as well. For over 300,000 people have died in this pandemic. 300,000 people. More people will die from this pandemic than they have died from cancer this year. Our ICU beds are full capacity in L.A. County. People are not sure if they will get evicted next month. People are afraid. People are weeping. People are hurting. And this is the reality of the world that we are living in. This is the reality of the world that we are celebrating Christmas today in. And that's why Christmas is more important to me this year than ever before. This is why Christmas means more to me than ever before. Because it reminds me of why we need Jesus. You see, we live in a world where our leaders abuse their power for their own ego or selfish gain, where children are murdered, where people suffer, where moms weep with the loss of their children, a world where it seems like evil triumphs over good. But dear friends, even though that is part of the story, it is not the end of the story. Praise God for that. For there is hope and good news. But where? You see, just as Matthew quotes from Jeremiah 31, 15 about Rachel, Jeremiah 31, 15, Jeremiah 31 does not end that way. As a matter of fact, in verses 16 and 17, it says this, Thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. You see, there is hope for your future, declares the Lord. And your children shall come back to their own country. You see, right after Jeremiah makes that prophecy of that lament, God hears Rachel. God cares about her grief. Because he says that he will make all things right. He will restore. And the children will come back from the land of their enemies. You see, in the same way God hears our weeping, God sees our grief. Not only does he hear, but he will do something. For what will God do? God will send his son into this world to be born. For God is the one who will leave the glories of heaven to enter a world like this. You see, God did not wait for when things were good or when things were going to get better or when there was going to be a good king. He did not wait till it was safe. 
No, he entered when it was filled with evil, when it was filled with pain, when the world was filled with suffering. And he did not send his son to be born to a rich and powerful family that would be able to shield him and protect him from all the evil and the pain of the world. No, he did not send him to be born in a state-of-the-art hospital. But instead, he was born into a poor family whose father would be a simple carpenter, who would be born in a dirty manger without any fanfare. He would be born in a, to a world before he was able to say a word that his life would be threatened by a paranoid king. Don't you see? He entered the world just like us so that he may identify with us. Just as John 1.14 said, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we see in his glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. What does it mean that the word, that he became flesh and dwelt among us? Matthew tells us that he'll be born in a dirty manger to a poor family. In other words, he enters when he became flesh and dwelt among us. It meant that he would enter our pain and our suffering. He was not treated special. He was not isolated, but he was just like us. As Hebrews 4, 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. That he is able to sympathize with our weakness and our pain. Why? Because that is how he came. He understands. He has lived that life. He's entered our pain and our suffering and our weaknesses so that we know that we are not alone indeed. Yet he was not only born to sympathize with our pain and suffering, but he was born so that he may redeem it. For remember, just as Moses was saved in the Nile when the Hebrew baby boys were being killed by the Egyptians, why was he saved? So that he could be the deliverer of God's people. But we know that Moses would point to the greater deliverer, the greatest deliverer of all. For two, Jesus would escape the bloody massacre of Bethlehem so that he could be our Savior and Redeemer to save us from our, sin, from our sins and from death indeed. You see, the reason why he was saved, because it was not his time to die. For he had his work to finish. But I love what Wendy Zorba says about this. This is what she writes. Jesus had to get away in order to face the day when the angels would not intervene. And when Joseph would not whisk him to Egypt. When Mary, not Rachel, wept and could not be comforted. Because you see, my friend. Yes, Jesus escaped the brutality of that night. But he would not escape the greatest brutality of all, the brutality of the cross. Because you see, 33, late year, 33 years later, he would be brutally killed. Not by sword, but by the nails in his hands and the nails in his feet at a cross. And he would experience the greatest separation of all, for his father would turn his back on his own son, whom he loved for all eternity, as he bore our sins upon that cross. He suffered the very worst that the world can do to us. No, he did not escape that brutality. For that brutality would be delayed and afflicted by another leader, leader another king, upon him. But he did it so that you and I could be set free. So that you and I can be redeemed. And when it seemed that the leaders would get their way, but they didn't. For Christ would rise again from the dead. He would conquer sin and death. He would reverse, this, he would reverse the curse of sin and death. No, sin and evil will not have the final say, but Christ will have the final word because he is the one who is exalted. He is the one who has gained the victory. He is the king that will be over all other kings in this world. He is the one who has won the victory. And that is why it is good news. 
That is why we celebrate this birth. This is why as we continue to see sin prospering, massacres occurring, good people suffering, we know that that is not the end of the story, but Christ is the one who reigns. Christ is the one who is Lord indeed. And that is what Christmas tells us. And I know, dear friends, that grief is real. And I want you to know that. It is real, but it is not the ultimate. As 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, But we, want, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. We do not grieve as one without hope. For our hope is in Christ, and he promises in Revelation 21 verse 4, he will wipe every tear away from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. That's why he is born. Not to sympath only sympathize with us, but so that one day you and I would weep no more. That's why it's good news. Yet until that day comes, know that he understands your grief. He understands your pain. For that is why he came. So that you and I will not be able to weep anymore. This is the victory that we celebrate today. This is why I'm grateful for this brutal story. Because it reminds me of the hope that we have. Dear friends, I know that Christmas will not be the same. But the message of Christmas remains the same. And I pray that no matter what you're going through, to know that you have this hope, that our Savior was born, so that you would be set free indeed. Merry Christmas. And may the glory of this birth change your life, both now and forevermore. Let's pray. This morning, how are you? If you're going through pain and suffering, I want you to know a Savior was born so that you don't have to weep no more. You see, that night in Bethlehem, when the mother perhaps asked, why didn't he save our sons? He did. For he came to save us from sin and death. And I pray that this morning that the joy of this birth will bring some light into your darkness. Though we may not understand, we don't understand why things happen, that we know that he is Lord and he is sovereign. So dear friends, can we celebrate him today? Let's just thank God for the birth of this child and give him all the glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this story. For it reminds us, Lord, of how much you love us. Because it is that world that your son was born. And Father, even though that night in Bethlehem, he may have escaped the brutality of Herod. God, he will not escape the brutality of the cross. For that is why he came to not only sympathize with us in our pain and our suffering, but so that, God, that we would weep no more. For he would go to a cross <clears throat> and die to set us free. And, Father God, as we have heard that there is nothing worse than a mother to lose her child. And how much, Father God, do we understand now of 
how much he loved us. That you would lose your son for us. So Father, we give you thanks that God, that your son was born on Christmas Day. That he is the light of the world. The word that became flesh and dwelt among us. We thank you that God, that we are not alone. But that God, that we have a savior who loves us, is with us, is the one who now rules and reigns. And God, we look forward to the day where all things will be made right. There'll be no more tears, no more suffering, and no more pain. So God, we pray for those who are going through that pain and suffering. We pray for those who have experienced such great loss in the midst of this pandemic. Lord, this virus is real. And so we pray, Father God, for healing and comfort and peace. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Redeemer, would you rise as we respond? Sing, O Come. Come, all you unfaithful, come. We can stay, come. No, you are not alone. Come, bearing and waiting ones, weary of praying, come. See what your God has done. Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born for you. Oh, come, bitter and broken, come, come with fierce Spoken, come taste of his perfect love. Oh, come, guilty and hiding ones, there is no need to run. See what your God has done. Christ is born. Oh, Christ is born, Christ is born for you. He's the Lamb who was given, slain for our pardon. His promise is peace for those who believe. He's the Lamb who was given, slain for our part. His promise is peace for those who believe. So come, though you have nothing, come. He is the offering, come. See what your God has done. Christ is born. Christ is born. Christ is born for you. Christ is born. Christ is born. Christ is born for you. Amen, amen. Christ is born for you today. And so I pray that all of you would have a wonderful and Merry Christmas. Be safe um, and take care and be healthy. We look forward to 2021. We look for next Christmas where we will all be together, hopefully, in person, celebrating and worshiping our God, King King. So God bless all of you. And now may you receive God's benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was born on Christmas morn, 
And the love of God our Father who loves us was a sacrificial and undying love. And the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit that tells us that we have a day that is waiting for us, that we will weep no more. Be with you now and forevermore. Amen and amen.